exhibition artist, graphic novelist, uh, Bessie Award nominated Harvard fellow who completed his Master of Fine Arts at the University of Buffalo. He lectures and exhibits internationally, discussing the complexities of decolonized future spaces. His graphic novels include uh, I Am Afonso Jones, written by Tony Medina, uh, from Lee and Lowe Books, and Across the Tracks, Remembering Greenwood, Black Wall Street, and the Tulsa Massacre, written by Alvern Ball. His latest curated exhibition, Ascension of uh, Black Stillness at the SEPA Gallery featured 10 Black artists using photography to contextualize liberated Black futures. Um, and just like Alex, I met Stacy uh, about a year, maybe two years ago at uh, Seminole State because he came to speak. Uh, and he is um, an extremely delightful brother. Uh, I remember having to call him for a piece of information. And he and I ended up talking for about an hour. Um, so he's full of information. Uh, he is also one half of uh, Black Kirby. And if you have not gone to the Hurston Museum to check out that exhibit curated by uh, Julian Chambliss, uh, you should see it uh, because not only is it visually stunning, but it is full of information and inspiration. So uh, without keeping you any longer, I give to you all Stacy Robinson. Stacy, floor is yours. All right, thank you. I hope you all hear me. You all hear me? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Sorry for the delay. Uh, my car broke down. I found out it was my drive shaft or drive train or whatever. I was stuck out in traffic and it was a crazy experience. Um, but uh, that we're pushing forward. So sorry for the delay. I'm gonna jump right into this. So we have plenty of time for Q&A. And I'm experimenting a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen. Experimenting a little bit with this. You all see this? All right, you all see my screen? So a hands up. Awesome. Let's get right into this. All right. So I didn't title this talk. And this is because I'm in a, a liminal space that, you know, as an artist, I'm constantly experimenting and thinking about um, the next steps, right? I, I'm one of those artists who I'll make something and I don't spend a lot of time in the moment. I'm always thinking about the next moment. So you're catching me at this, what I'm thinking about as this liminal space of me really um, figuring out the next stages of my practice. And you're gonna see, I'm gonna share a lot of that with you. So those of you who did maybe catch that talk at, at Seminole State, um, some of this will be familiar, but this piece right here is looking at what I'm beginning to philosophize and theorize as an algorithm for black liberation and the healing of trauma. Uh, our colonial trauma, right? So if we can think about, um, if we can think about white supremacy as a philosophy and racism as a system that supports the philosophy, then also our liberation, our freedom and our nationhood also looks like a particular thing. Um, and this is an abstraction of an algorithm that I'm thinking about just to kind of jumpstart my own imagination and looking at that. So um, to contextualize the work moving forward, uh, I need to say that the way that I'm thinking about my work now is I, I compare it and I look at it as how I think about nationhood. Every nation has five to six things that they, they that define their nationhood. And what I like to think about there is that every nation of people have um, a sovereign land. They have a government that legislates their sovereignty. They have a military that defends their sovereignty. They have a form of currency that allows for global trade and commerce. They have, and one of the fifth thing I like to say is that their God looks like them, right? 
So, and then the sixth thing I'm also thinking about is they have their own language. So this is what I'm thinking about as, as a framework for beginning to define what Black nationhood looks like. Why am I thinking about Black nationhood? Because as we are in a point, um, specifically as, as Black people, scholars, very smart Black people, um, we are defining the parameters of um, the intersectionality. Right. And the intersection, I like to do the Wakanda salute, I like to think about the, the intersection of, of intersectionality. Right. And in that intersectionality, you know, consists of class, race, sexuality and gender. We may want to define some other things in those in those in that, uh, in that intersection. But one of the things that I'm finding is that we are doing a really good job of defining are redefining gender and sexuality. And we converse about class often. However, we are not doing a good job of defining what our blackness is. Until we define what our blackness is, I do not believe that we can petition our government for the justice and the equity that we so very much deserve. Um, and because we can't define ourselves as a nation, I don't believe that we can. Um, we also have no, no balancing power to demand any justice or equity. So I believe that our freedom and justice looks like a particular thing. And I'm balancing that by thinking about those six things that I, I just mentioned a moment ago. Okay. So I'm not going to talk much about uh, Black Kirby because it is in the museum there. You should you should definitely check it out. They will. Uh, we are John and I uh, are celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year, and we have an exhibition uh, dropping soon at, at the Culver Center and at, at the University of California Riverside, downtown Riverside, called BKX, which is you know, Black Kirby 10, right? But I did want to just highlight this one particular piece that will give some context moving forward, um, even to the work that you'll see in the exhibition. And that is this Kid Code Tracks to Freedom uh, comic that John and I did. So I want to say it's a 15 page comic that was done for uh, the Black Comics Arts Festival in 2015, and it was lettered by uh, Damian Duffy. Um, I believe it might have been scripted. I think it was scripted by Damian as well. And um, this is a piece that looks at our character Kid Code and his team, Roxy Clockwise and Father Time, as they interact, as they have to go back in time um, and, and save Dr. King. <laughs> I'm gonna give a little bit of context to where my work is now and where it has been for the last several years. Um, I was away on a Harvard fellowship, the Nazia Jones Fellowship, 2019 through, through 2020. And the focus of my work looked at how I, uh, it looked at the uh, large portion of my record collection, the art that, that inspired me growing up, um, the, the cover art for the, these, um, these images, or for these albums rather, and how that influenced me to make art and think about uh, a mytho our own mythologies and, and how I started to build out mythologies and thinking through the ideas of sampling and remixing. So for example, um, these are some examples of, of album art that I have in my collection that I, from a really awesome, from these two awesome, beautiful Black women who entrusted me with their family's record collection. Um, both of them are no longer with us um, now. And that means a lot to me because they, they trusted me with their, uh, with their family's records. And that really influenced me to really push forward with how I'm thinking about this work. So this drawing that you see here, I'm drawing on the iPad Pro using a program called Procreate. 
And this is a piece I call grandma's hands. This is an unfinished piece. I like to show my process work. And this is a black grandmother. You see her weathered hands laying her praying hands on her grandson as he is looking back through the um, what could be looked at as a cipher or a halo of hip hop. And what we may see once I finish this piece is the emergence of uh, red and, and blue light. Now, if you notice that both her, the grandson and the grandma's hands are raised, right? Her hands are raised in, in prayer and protection. His hands are raised in surrender and showing his, um, we may want to think about it as his um, creating an atmosphere where he is docile trying to survive the experience, right? Uh, this is another piece. This is a piece that I'm revisiting right now as I'm working on a Nazia Jones um, art series, um, a, a what we call that a visual essay. And this is looking at Pete Rock summoning pianist Ahmad Jamal uh, through a the cipher of the record. So producer Pete Rock is, is summoning Ahmad Jamal and Nas Nas and, and Jamal are speaking backward and forward into time. And as, as Pete Rock is summoning them through the record. And I call this piece triple cipher because um, there are three ciphers going on in this piece. So once again, I'm building the mythology, right? Even looking at my one of my favorite DJs, Larry Levan, who is a DJ at the Paradise Garage in New York City. Um, and the beginning days of house music coming from out of disco and other forms of music. And he was a DJ at the Paradise Garage. And what I love about uh, Levan is that the Paradise Garage where he was a space, a safe space for uh, the black and otherwise marginalized community. And this space through the sonics of this space brought out the black and queer communities, uh, the, the, the brown and queer communities on nights that at that time would have been different nights, but through the sonics and through the, the, the space, the, the space became a, um, how can we say, a, a unified space in a very unique way. So I imagine Levan here summoning these marginalized communities through the record um, into what I'm ref referring to as the other side of time, where the Paradise Garage, once it was demolished, emerged, right? So the other side of time, referring to sunrise, the other side of time, where um, LeVan is casting this spell, uh, summoning those who can hear it, those who can feel it, those who are part of that into through the record and into the safe space of us on the other side of time. Once again, thinking about mythologies through this art practice. But I'm working in a tradition, right? And I'm, I'm I'm, um, I'm working in the traditions of, for example, uh, Chancellor Williams in this piece called The Reconstruction of Black Civilization, right, which is a play on the second, um, his first and second book, actually. And then I'm looking at um, Black freedom, psychology, sociology, as well as I'm looking at creating a hundred I'm looking at creating 360 images that will kind of define how I'm philosophizing and theorizing our liberation. This is going to take many years, but I've started this, this project. And these are some of the pieces. Uh, you may recognize Franz from on there. And um, I'm in the middle, uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. And on the left-hand side, John Henry Clark. So this art practice comes out of artists like I want to um, like Maddie Claire Ween, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, who created the uh, classic Miles Davis cover "Bitches Brew," right, and the uh, uh, Santana's Abraxas album with uh, Oye Como Va and Black Magic Woman. If you're familiar with Santana, but I'm also working in the tradition of Overton Lord, right, who is what and, and Pedro Bell, who are two of the artists for Parliament Funkadelic. 
just to name a few. Right. But, you know, and, and thinking about this art, looking at the black liberated spaces that we created through the sonics of our traditions. Right. So the Mortar Booty Affair album by Parliament, which um, I have three copies of this album. And when this album opens up, it is an underwater city called Atlantis. And you see what Atlantis looks like, right? So I believe that when you, you cannot expect Black people to activate the Afro future until they can see the Black liberated Afro future, right? You got, we got to jumpstart the Black imagination. And that's what my work that hoped works to do. But I'm also working in the traditions of Emory Douglas, right, who is a minister of culture for the Black Panther Party, and looking at political art manifestos and where his uh, points six and nine in his manifesto talk about creating art of social concerns that even a child can understand or creating art that challenges the colonization of the imagination. And you see other artists here who are my influence are Charles Bibbs on the upper left hand side and uh, Cynthia St. James um, at the uh, bottom at the bottom there as well. Right, so I'm also looking at the Black Panther 10 point program and I'm going to move to this really quickly I'm not going to read all of this, uh, but just look at the highlighted points and you can see uh, points like uh well let me read actually let me read one uh we want freedom we want power to determine the destiny of our black community point seven we want the immediate end of police brutality and the murder of black people and point 10 we want land bread housing education clothing justice and peace these are things that we were demanding 50 years ago we are still demanding them today but once again until we can define ourselves as a nation i believe that uh, we will always have to rely on the grace and the mercy of our government. And as we know, that has consistently failed us. Progress is very slow. I'm going to skip through some of these. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these. We can go back if we have time. I want to make sure that we are moving through. These are just other examples of how I'm inspired by record covers to really build down and think about our philosophies um, our, and our jumpstart our imagination to think about our own Black liberated futures. All right. So, and, you know, in recent years, I'm sure we may all be very tired of hearing diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? But this became, this became something that I, kind of gra I grabbed onto because I was asked to be part of so many DEI uh, and DEI even now we've added on to those letters right but I was asked to be part of so many a part of so many committees that I really needed to develop a working definition for myself um, and I'm not going to read this but you know, take a look at this as I'm talking about it. And this is how I started to frame out my art exhibitions right so, I started started thinking about how can I build, how can I transform the gallery, the library, the museum space into a space that is for us to talk about these our issues, our issues of concern. So from there, uh, this was a, a a Black Kirby project from um, twenty. When, yeah, 2020, <laughs> yes, the, the date is on it. You know, in the quarantine, every day seems the same. <laughs> so um, this was a piece called Hashtag Black Matters. This was a, a billboard series for SEPA Gallery in Buffalo, New York. And John and I came up with 12 hashtags. You may recognize the Franz Fanon reference uh, there on the left-hand side, right? So. Uh, but these were 12 hashtags, and I think that you, the, these images function in a way where those who are driving by can read the text, but those who are walking by could actually spend some time and really look at the images. So these images were juxtaposed with, with the hashtag te uh, text. For example, um, Black Freedom Matters, or Black Family Matters, or Black Love Matters, or Black Education Matters. This was a very successful billboard series and um, 
we're current, well, one of the next projects we're gonna do is create these as a coloring book that we give away free to the community and to educators. That might, that takes us to up to the, um, Abrams Comic Arts and Megascope and the first line of books that dropped through uh, John's imprint. And one of those books is Across the Tracks, which I illustrated and it was written by Alvern Ball and lettered by uh, Damian Duffy and colored by my son Solomon and my former student Alex Batchelor and my former student uh, Anthony Moncada. This is some of the process images. I like to show my process because I want to kind of demystify that. I want people to find, you know, totally bite techniques, right? Totally, if this works for you, these techniques work for you. I want to, I want you to be able to access them. So I'm, I'm treating this, I, I draw in just like traditional comics. I sketch out a layer. And then on top of, on, on that layer, um, I will do what are called inks. And then I send that to the colorist. Uh, and um, where my son colored this page, I believe, and he did flat color, he created flat color. And we added highlights. I just decided to add highlights on only the main figures in the foreground. Sorry, these, some of these images need to be replaced, so they may be a little pixelated on your end. I hope you can see them clearly. One of the problems we ran into with Across the Tracks is that um, this was about the Tulsa Race Massacre, right? And, and rebuild, I like to add that part, the rebuild, because they did rebuild immediately after this, the destruction of uh, Black Wall Street. A lot of that history was destroyed though. And we had to knock this book out in less than two months. 50 pages we knocked out in less than two months. Um, and we dropped it in time for the centennial uh, of the event, which was May 31st and through June 1st of last year. Some of the problems that we ran into was we didn't know who what figures looked like. So I really had to exercise um, some creativity and thinking about what some of these figures, what some of these historical figures look like. And I didn't have the time to travel to, to Tulsa, to the, the uh, museum there to, to do research. Just showing you some more process. This brings me to a theoretical map that I had to create in order to kind of organize my thoughts, where I started thinking about systems that guide my, my, my thinking and my art practice, but I never really wrote down or, or created a map that helped me organize those thoughts. This is a, um, a kind of first attempt at looking at the systems that inspire me, whether it's the 12 jewels of the 5% nations of gods and earths, which looks at uh, before we can have the last three in the 12 jewels, which is love, peace, and happiness, we must first develop and under have um, and gain knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in order to uh, gain freedom, justice, equality, and in order to secure food, clothing, and shelter. And having all of those things, then we create love, peace, and happiness. Or looking at the five primary elements of hip hop, and then the uh, the Nguza Saba, Nguza Saba and those seven principles of Kwanzaa. Looking at these as a system that uh, center and ground myself, while on the circumference of that, I'm thinking about my, my family, my descendants, elders, and ancestors, uh, my calling, aspiration, career, and job, and the, com my com the community, alliances, mentorship, and education that I surround myself with as well. So these have started to kind of guide my practice to lead me to thinking about uh, future spaces and community places, which is an exhibition. I'm sorry, some of these images, some of these need to be replaced. So sorry these, that these are blurry. Uh, communities, future spaces and community places was, um, 
an exhibition at the University YMCA here in, uh, on the campus of, of U of I, where I teach. And it was an exhibition uh, with four of my collaborators, uh, Shea Robinson, No Relation, who is a community poet and activist and organizer who really works to hold, uh, house and clothe and feed some of my, our most needy in the Urbana community. And my other collaborator, who uh, Kamal Grantham, who is one of my DJ mentors, really good friend and collage artist who we, I have so much in common with. And once we found out how many, uh, just like with John, once we found out how many things we had in common, we decided we really should be collaborating on some things. And then John Jennings was the other collaborator. Um, and these are some of our images. So the first image you see there is a collage that Kamau and I made. We are collage artists. Our, our name is Black Mao. So his name is Kamau. My Art alias is Black Star, and uh, together we are Black Mao. The middle image is one of the funky totems of Black Kirby's original series from 2012, um, the Mother Box Connection. And, and um, the third piece is a piece I'm work, uh, from a project that I'm working on with Shea where well, I'll talk about that in a moment, called Stargazer, where we are looking at a Black girl who finds her self-esteem through her ancestry, uh, which really is, all of this is birthed through her thinking about um, chronicling, documenting, and journaling, right? So you see some of those characters in the lower left-hand side, the the pencil and the eraser and the gold stars and the journal, which are the characters that accompany um, this little girl star throughout her, um, you know, throughout her, her young life as she is finding herself. This is a prototype. So the girl does looks very different um, in all of the images because we're figuring out what she's going to look like, her skin tone, coloring style, et cetera. The writing that you see on the images are, um, that is the work of Shea. Some of the coloring is also done by Shea. The sketch here you see on the left-hand side um, is a picture of her being surrounded by her ancestors. That's a, a rough sketch as we're figuring out this prototype of what is this gonna be? Like we're thinking about it as an activity book. We're thinking about it as a journal. We're thinking about it as, um, coloring book and, and other things as well. It's one of my favorite images. Both of those are actually. We even imagine Star as a, uh, maybe a pre-teenager, a teenager, um, and then the friends she might have gathered along the way, right? So what type of adventures would they have if they're writing their own story? Uh, Black Mal, this is, these are some images. Uh, Kamau and I work really well together. We make a lot of images by ourselves and together. This is from, excuse me, we've been working together, excuse me, from, 20, uh, from 2019. And this is, these are two pieces from our second body of work. Kamau's style is very different from mine. Uh, Kamau is a, uh, an artist who works with minimalism a lot. Uh, that's his piece. Um, it was with the text space on it. And mine is the one on the left-hand side. And I see, an, uh, if you don't, let me check out the Q&A. Have I... Yeah, so an animated series. Well, hey, stop jumping ahead of me. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yes, uh, my first love is actually animation. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. This is awesome. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> stop jumping ahead of me. All right. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Uh, 
I'm so sorry that some of these are, are pixelated. Oh, this is frustrating. All right. So I started working on a Black boy series, and I'm going to talk to you for about 10 more minutes, maybe, and then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, I started working on a Black boy series because last summer, there, was, there were so many stories of um, these young adult t and, and teen murders that were happening. And, and it just made me want to, you know, work on a series about Black boys and, and showing ourselves as beautiful. And this is a piece of a Black boy in a liminal space between decisions, right? Um, not saying what this decision is, but when, when I write about this, this will be, you know, the, the space between, is this the space between him losing his life um, as his hands are up and surrender? Um, is this the, the liminal space of, of this, this black boy realizing that his life needs to change? What is the liminal space? I, I haven't defined that, but in that space of realization and, and, and new understanding, uh, what does that look like? So I started to just really kind of draw like stream of consciousness. And, and I'm not necessarily saying I like this piece. I don't know if this will necessarily make the cut, but I'm showing it because this is where I'm at right now. I also uh, drew this, this piece about a, a father with his two sons and, and uh, these two boys are very, very different. Uh, I did work on this piece. I should have definitely replaced this because I did color, I did ink and color in the headphones. My son has some cat ear headphones and uh, my son is a massive black geek, you know, and I wanted to draw something that kind of looked at him and, and thought about him. But the other boy also seems to kind of embody my son's attitude as well. And this is really looking at two different, um, you know, black boys who with two different personalities, but really are both very much my son. I'm working, I am working on an animated series. This piece uh, will be animated, the piece you see on the left-hand side. I'm not even going to tell you what this story is about yet because it's so dope of an idea. If I ever see it out there, I know it will be because I put the idea out there and somebody else ran with it and beat me to it. So I'm not going to tell you what this story is about. But this uh, this will be an animated series, and this is some of the this is one of the stills that I will animate when I say animate I'm really talking about motion graphics so I will use Adobe After Effects which I am teaching myself now these are some details from the piece that you saw um, on the former slide Um, it was mentioned, thank you for mentioning Ascension of Black Stillness. I appreciate that. Um, I, got, I got into curating again, and I was asked to curate a show a number of years ago, and um, that happened last fall. And what's important about this is me saying yes to this project means that 12 artists got paid uh, to exhibit their work, and they... All they had to do was either mail in their pieces or send their pieces digitally. And hopefully this will be the first of three series. So the first um, series, Ascension of Black Stillness, was all photo-based uh, Afrofuturism themed pieces. And the reason, these are some images from the opening. The reason why it focused on photography was because SEPA is a photo gallery. And I wanted to show that there are Black artists who are working in photography, but thinking about what our future looks like. And this, um, this catalog is available online. We are in conversation about a second uh, series, a uh, second uh, exhibition in the series, and a third. And that brings us up to uh, Parable Path CU, which is uh, 
parable path is is Toshi uh, Regan's um, opera that she tours. And unfortunately, due to obvious reasons, uh, we had to postpone the um, her visit to our campus. But I was able to um, a few months ago, I was able to um, moderate a panel with you know, John and Damien Toshi and Adrian Marie Brown, uh, looking at Parable Path. I don't know if that is still available. I don't think that is available online anymore, but it was an amazing conversation. And as much as I talk about defining what our Blackness is, um, Adrian really challenged me where, you know, she said we should not define what our Blackness is because we would put that in a box. And excuse me a minute. Um, All right, so, um, and this was a piece uh, that was created for the exhibition as, as well. This is not the exhibition, pardon me. I created this, this is in the exhibition that I had up at the University YMCA, but this is a piece that I created for the Parable Path. And this is looking at, um, it is a reference to Parable of the Sower. So for those of you who have not read it, I do not want to spoil that, but this is um, a reference to that, a, a community that is emerging out of the fire. And what does that, what do our acorns look like, our surrounding community? So you see a bunch of acorns surrounding this abstraction of a community um, that is emerging I would, I, you know, it's an abstraction of a fire that's really kind of simulated through the use of color. I also did it in fall, so I tried to use fall colors to kind of mark the time. But one of the things I thought about is as we're always talking about our communities, that we talk about them many times and in, as someone else's responsibility, somebody ought to do something about that, right? Or when is somebody going to such and such and such and such? And I wanted to show the acorns always around us in our very grasp. All right. And I'm picking up, there we go. All right, cool. So I wanted to go back to my mind map, what that might look like, what that, you know, what that looks like, because once again, this is framing my thought. And I want to talk about some current pieces that I'm looking at that I, I made like within the last three weeks. And I'm going back into a minstrel series where I'm looking at minstrel characters as um, black aliens or aliens that came to earth and actually survived through uh, minstrelsy and what that might look like as a narrative. Uh, and on the that so that's buckwheat and and, and a Cadillac uh, flying through space, and that is actually a uh, buckwheat's hat. Buckwheat was a character on the Little Rascals, if if anybody remembers the Little Rascals. But also looking at at um, like buckwheat is armed, <laughs> right, right. And so the text says, if you can't read, it says, hey, cause we got a problem up up problem up here, nah make it plain, okay, right? So it is buckwheat, you know, buckwheat, you know, he might appear to be this, this docile um, type of character that, you know, that only we only see as entertainment. But I looked at this actor and I'm blanking, I'm blanking on the actor's name as a real person. And what was his life really like, right? So I'm, I'm going through some history to think about um, it by making a body of work, it allows me to dive deeper into the history and, and do some research. But I really ask a lot of questions by making work. These pieces that you see on the um, on the right hand side are three images from a new series that is coming out. Uh, 
uh, it's the world of Larry Fuller's Eben, which is, I believe, the first independent Black superhero. And Eben is in his, I mean, uh, Larry Fuller is in his 70s now. And John and I, um, in conjunction with our 10 year anniversary show, working with the Culver Center, we are also realizing the world of Larry Fuller's Eben. So, what does that look like? I'm a collage artist. So, I'm, I'm imagining what that lo world looks like through. Um, the cityscape at the bottom, which is the world of NIDA, possibly, and then the Pantheon of Gods, which I illustrated maybe 12 of them through collage. All right. I'm also trying to check the chat. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And the q and I want to make sure that I'm getting to all of your, I'm about to end soon, so we have time. All right. So, hey, got, um, I, Carnegie Hall exhibition dropping in a few days, right? <laughs> Open it up. So I'm part of this Afrofuturism exhibition at Carnegie Hall, um, showing you some pieces that I've not shown in any talk yet. So this uh, first piece that you're looking at here is called God Forbid, and it's a Black boy really looking at uh, thinking about his mortality, because a lot of the boys that I'm engaging with are young kids, they're 15, 16, younger than 20, and they're thinking about their mortality and, and they shouldn't be. You know, I don't think they should be, but they are. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see young people, young boys really think about mortality to the, to the extent where they make babies you know, at a young age with women because they don't believe that they'll be alive in the future. This is really, really deep. And it's something that I'm really gonna spend some time looking at. At the same time, I made this piece called Earth Seed, which imagines this orb um, that might've been casted into the future or survived the time that we're in or whatever. And that is open, that has everything that we need to restart our planet um, inside this Earth Seed. Um, I'm a DJ. I'm going to close with real in a moment. I'm a DJ. I'm spinning a ri original uh, vinyl. I'm collecting vinyl, still collecting vinyl. Um, and I'm my sound practice is emerging. So that piece that you that device that you see um, it, at the bottom left hand side is a beat make beat machine. It's an I um, an Akai um, live two and MPC live two. And I'm experimenting with making beats and sounds and, and collaging. What does I'm thinking about what does my art sound like, right? So this is another part of my practice that is emerging. And I wanted to show you what my home setup looks like as a DJ. And shouts out to um, uh, Blair Ebony Smith, who is uh, my new colleague um, in, in art and design and, um, and gender and women's studies. And we, she comes over to my, my, um, my studio where I also have DJ equipment and we spin together. She's awesome DJ. I also think that Afrofuturism looks like health. So I started documenting my food and sharing that online and sharing these recipes and things. And, and I have a following who, people who follow my food. That's really awesome. I document my journey because I'm really struggling um, you know, with maintaining good health, but I believe that's what the Afro future also looks like. I think it also looks like gardening. So I, I like to show this picture because these are the first plants that I bought. Um, and, and, um, I was gifted, um, some plants as well. All of them are dead right now. I did, I was not good <laughs> at planting, but then I did uh, plant a garden, which I was much better at this year. So I'm learning, right? So through the failures, I'm learning to, to do better, but I like to document my process. Um, these are pictures of me documenting my, my health journey as well. It's a constant struggle. My weight is up and down because in order for me to make this work, I have to be stationary. So um, I, you know, I talk about this. I go online and talk about how I went to my doctor and told me I need to be moving around in the afternoon right as well so i like to close in thinking about all of those things once again i believe our freedom our our justice our nationhood our liberation 
looks like an algorithm, just like white supremacy and racism um, is a, you know, racism is a system that supports the philosophy of white supremacy. Well, our freedom, justice, and equality also looks like an algorithm. And um, that's what an abstraction of what that might look like. Thank you very much. And I always like to end on Grace Jones because she is one of the illest artists that we might, we like to think about in Afrofuturism as well. And um, I like to, you know, begin and end on thinking about black women. All right, peace. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. You should, let me see if you see me now. Yes, we can see you. Awesome. Hope I did not take too much time. Sorry, I meant to end about 10 minutes ago, but I will try to answer questions quickly so that we can stay on time. All right. Thank you, Stacy. We're going to um, pull some thank you. Uh, questions from online. Awesome. And thank you to all the guests who are here as well. I see uh, 28 participants. I appreciate all of you coming. If we have no questions online, I have a question for Awesome. Um, so you talked a lot about defining blackness and how we have a difficulty in defining blackness and so forth. What do you think are some of the major themes in defining it? And what are some of the methods and ways in which we can do so? Yeah, so I, I think in order to do so, we one, first we have to have some real honest conversations around the failures of securing that in the past. Um, I also believe that, once again, those five things I mentioned, so every nation of people, right, have those five things. Sovereign land, a government that legislates their sovereignty, a military that defends their sovereignty, um, a form of global commerce, and um, their God looks like them, and also they have their own language system, right, which I always like to do this as a sixth. So, I believe we have to think about those things, right? What defines those things? I'm not saying that I'm necessarily right, right? But I don't believe that we can massage. Um, once again, we live with our colonizer and that's been the one of the difficulties for us to secure our freedom, right? The, the balance of this nation and the founding of this uh, nation is based on our subjugation. Um, in order to maintain that system, it means that we still have to remain subjugated in, in a colonial space. So we have to think about, I, I think we have to have honest conversations. I think the panels that, we, that we're on where we're talking about Afrofuturism have to not just think about the really fun, uh, shiny things that we like to talk about many times in Afrofuturism, right? We have to really converse what freedom looks like. Um, and here's the thing. Um, one of the things I did not talk about is there in there in my talk was that I, I went back to the gun range. I believe that uh, I believe in black people owning weaponry and defending our homes. Um, a lot of people don't like to talk about that, but I believe that that also it looks like that. Every You have to defend your sovereignty. You have to defend your space of freedom. We got to talk about that. We got to talk about, I, I think sometimes we, we want to shy away from uncomfortable conversations and, and conversations that are actual calls to action. I believe that when you see my work, that it, it, it is a call to action, um, especially when I talk about it, when I tell you what this work means. Um, some of the things we have to think about is, is once again, conditioning our bodies to be able to defend our homes, right? Whether it's against the police or whether it's against Pookie, we got to, we have to be able to defend ourselves. And that has to be a part of our conversation. I believe health needs to be a part of our, our Afrofuturism conversation and defining our blackness as well, right? Um, many times we argue for the freedom of mobility in the future, right? And whether that's through the freedom of our gender or, or sexuality, and we might define that and think about that as fluid, but at the same time, um, 
all of those things fall under blackness first. That's how I define that and think about that, right? So um, in that, I, I like to think about why, you know, Walter, what's up, my man? I just saw Walter in the front there, my man. Um, you know, we have to think about the, um, I see I just, I got distracted with my homeboy. <laughs> got distracted a little bit. We have to think about the, the, um, the failures that we failed to secure. And, and I think that health is one we got to talk about, um, why we shy away from defining our blackness and we settle in conversations around sexuality and gender. Police don't take a survey on any of those things. Um, we have to talk about what it means to live in this nation with our colonizer and what it means to leave this nation. And where do we go? Right. So if you think about it like a bad relationship, I call the relationship we have in America the most the example of the most toxic relationship um, that we could ever think of as an example. For example, we've been in this country 400 years. They they you know, our colonizers will not let us integrate and they will not let us separate. <laughs> right. When we separate, we become we become Black Wall Street, for example. Right. And those communities are destroyed because they become black and affluent, just like every other nation of people who unify and thought in action. We have to have these conversations around what this actually looks like for us. In part, I, oh, and the other thing I want to talk about, we also have to talk about why, um, why, you know, when when Juneteenth became a holiday, well, what does restorative justice look like? Right? Why why is it that there is not an anti-black hate bill? Right? And that's because we cannot demand one. We got to talk about that. America does America may owe us, but we have no power to demand that they pay us. We got to talk about that. That's what Afrofuturism looks like, too. I'm done running my mouth on that. Let's go to the next question. All right, Stacey, uh, if anybody in the audience doesn't have a question, you know, I certainly have one for you. All right. Awesome. Uh, Will I be in San, the San Diego area soon? Listen, um, the Omarion is out there. <laughs> I like to call it the Omarion and the Unicron, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yo, they are out there. Uh, I'm telling my students to stay safe. Um, many of my solo exhibitions are being, um, the, the receptions are being postponed. So I'm really trying to say no to a lot of things. And this, I'm trying to use that time to really build up the next stage of my practice. Uh, shout out to the person who asked me about animation, because that's what I'm working on. So I'm working on motion graphics. Um, and, and, and I'm taking a class this summer, a 2D animation class this summer. So I'm, I'm, I like to say I'm doing my DOS effects Ninja Turtle thing. I'm going back underground. I'm going in the sewer. I'm going underground. Um, and when I emerge, you know, I'm going to grind out the this moment that we're in and emerge with some things that that we can use to really visualize what our Black liberated futures look like. So I don't know if I'll be in the San Diego area or not. I do not plan to be. Can you can you read the question so that the audience here, if you're going to read them, uh, Stacy, and answer them? Can you read them aloud? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. So the that question. We'll know what they what they ask. Oh, I'm sorry. That was in the chat. So uh, let me see. That was from. Let me, who is that from? Uh, let me see. Was that? No, no. Who, who asked me that question? Let me read that. So Teresa. Oh, that was from Teresa. Teresa Ford asked me if I was going to be in the San Diego area soon. I do not plan to be. I'm sorry, I'm imagining y'all seeing all this too. Oh, cool, cool. Thank you, Jereen. Also, and uh, that comment from, I believe that's how you pronounce that, Jereen. Sorry if I got that wrong. Awesome presentation, asking the critical questions. I am, right? right. But the artwork also, like I say, I, I'm a visual learner. And as an artist, I know the power of imagery, right? So if you, just think about how our our culture changed when the Marvel Black Panther movie cinematic um, universe movie dropped, like Black Panther. How it changed our culture, right? So remember, how many of you remember that meme 
when that young um that young black man was standing in front of the Black Panther poster, right? He was like, and and it, it went viral. He was like, this is how y'all feel every day? Every day? He's pointing at the Black Panther poster. He was like, he says this. He's like, this is how y'all feel every day? He was like, I would love this country too. He's talking to white people when he says this. He was like, y'all see yourselves represented in every movie? This is how y'all feel? Because Black Panther got galvanized us in a very unique way, right? That's the power of imagery. And that's what I'm trying to not only recreate, but kind of keep constantly flowing. I'm, you know, as a DJ, you know, I like to think in, you know, the 33 and the third. I like to think in that, that full cipher, right? Um, thinking about sacred geometry, it never ends. So I like to keep bombarding you with, with, with images that really show us um, and the, the futures that we define. They do not always have to be utopian. It is okay if they are dystopian, like, but it will be one that we define. I don't believe that utopia is last, um, but that future will be one where we are active and we are defining that. All right. So, so, so Stacey, let me ask you a question, well, unless you wanna, cause I thought, are you done with the questions online? If we got a lot, if we got, a, <laughs> how, how many more we got? Cause it looks like we got like well, two well, or three we have, minutes. We, we, we have a question in the audience right here. Okay, cool. I wanna make sure I get to all of them. So I'll be as concise okay. as possible. Sorry that I arrived a little late. I had classes, but I was curious hey. about a part of your conversation um, discussing like, well, I guess my first question is pertains to the utopia dystopia distinction. Mm -hmm. So you think that embracing dystopias is a better approach than embracing utopias? Not necessarily, but I, well, uh, oh, that's a great question. So here's the thing. I might contradict myself with that. Here's the thing. I actually make pieces that are, are about embracing the dystopia. I have a piece called San, um, Dark Sankofa, which is an image of a young Black woman looking toward the future to um, a, a planet that is ours and the emergence of what our freedom looks like through an abstraction, right? But as she's looking toward the future, she also has her hand embracing a great white shark that's dressed in a corporate suit. I did not include that in this talk. Um, and that great white shark symbolizes um, the, the, the sharks that would follow the slave ships. So many black bodies were thrown overboard. So many Africans committed suicide on, in the middle passage that sharks learned to follow the ships and they ate you know, aid us, right? Um, we have to embrace what that means. We are still in a colonized space. I don't believe, here's the thing, right? I might contradict myself. Here's the thing with this. I talk about how we have to define what our blackness is in order to define what our uh, liberation, freedom, and nationhood look like. But I also believe that we cannot define what our blackness is until we are outside of a colonial space. I have no okay, problem showing the contradiction because I'm not trying to create the answer solely. It's a conversation that happens with the collective of us, right? Um, if we can't, so why can't we define that so completely now in a colonized space? Because the definition of our blackness will always be in reflection of whiteness. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I answered that question. Um, may I ask another one? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, up to uh, you. So we're at the 12, um, the one o'clock hour. I will stay on as long as you want me to stay. Uh, so y'all monitor the time. Okay. Go, go ahead, you're gonna ask yourself. Um, this one kind of pertains to the conversation I walked in and on in, but like, because like, I'm like pretty young, like I'm a freshman in college, Right I'm on. like still learning how to orient orientate myself in like spaces that are not only but black, just multicultural, and like how mm -hmm. I want to orientate myself in terms of whiteness. Yeah. And I was wondering. Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I was, I'm fifty in in, in March and March twenty fourth. I'll be fifty, doing the same thing. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering um what you had to say about in terms of our voices and conversations, how do we make our voices louder? Do you think that is through these forms of conversation and keep having them and bring more people? Or do we Ooh. need to do something more direct and more like 
I guess, abrasive in a sense? Yeah. So here's the thing. When you say, you know, that is interesting, right? The reason why we ask questions like this is because we never want to offend white people, right? And the thing that we're doing, right? We always want to make sure that we don't offend them, but while we celebrate ourselves. Um, I stopped doing, I stopped qualifying and quantifying. When I say I love black people, I don't quantify that by saying, oh, but that, that doesn't mean I, I don't hate white people. No, I say I love black people. Leave it right there, right? I'm, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm almost 50. So I feel I, like I don't have the time anymore. Like if, if I live a long life matching the other, the, the, the patriarchs in my family, I have about 40 years left on this planet. And I say, I told you, I struggle with my health, right? I'm not trying to massage those who don't align with our freedom, our justice, inequality. I'm making this art. I'm saying what I have to say. And we are we are moving on. The train is moving. Either you want if you, either you're going to get on this train or you're going to get run over by the train. You got shouts out to my homeboy, John, Jan Michael Franklin. He said you got three options. The train is moving. You can get on the train. You can move out the way or get ran the F over. You decide. Right. Choose wisely. Right. I'm, I'm stealing that from my homeboy. Right. The train is moving. My artwork is moving. I'm not trying to catch everybody up anymore. The thing about your generation that's really interesting, your generation is a lot, is, a lot of y'all ain't scared. A lot of y'all are not scared. Y'all will square off with the police. Y'all will, y'all are tired. Y'all saw our generation and, and older generations marching and not securing justice. Y'all are operating on a very different level. Here's the thing, you always are, we're, be responsible with your voice, but also don't be scared to use your voice. You know what you feel like when you walk into a space and that space is not dominated by people who look like you. You know what that feels like. You're not imagining that. You know what a microaggression is. We live these experiences, right? So what's important, I believe, is that you are responsible with your voice, that you do speak up. But I also think it's very important to gather those who feel the same way. Many times we think we're in the, we feel these things by ourselves, and we don't. I know what it's like to feel that. And I'm telling you, I'm almost 50. You're talking about this as a freshman in, in, in college. Yep, this is how the system is designed, how spaces are defined. We're supposed to feel these particular ways. I've just gotten to the point where um, I've become a lot more bold. I don't ask people to like my work. I don't care if you like the work. I'm showing you what black freedom looks like. If you don't like what my version of freedom looks like, that's cool. You make it and show us what it looks like too. That's awesome, right? It's a collective conversation. This train is moving. <laughs> we ain't got time to be sitting back around trying to massage people. Into, well, you know, we, we don't want to offend anybody. Nah, damn that. Because let me tell you, we've been offended for over 400 years. Real talk. All right, I'm done with that answer. I hope that I we, hope that we, we uh, Stacey, we are we are out of time. At, right, we're at the the point where we need to give everybody a break to, to get ready for John. Uh, so well, uh, shoot, church just got good. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just started preaching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and 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 church sometimes never ends. Right? Oh, you right about that. Hey, yeah. listen, before we close, let me throw my um. I'm not going to put this in the chat. Y'all can hit me up on Instagram, Stacy uh, R Stacy A Robinson on Instagram, S T A C E Y A Robinson on Instagram. I'm on Facebook as well. I'm out here in these streets, y'all. Y'all can find me, right? So y'all hit me up. I'm on Twitter yeah. as well, Prof S A Robinson. <laughs> y'all give Stacy a hand. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I will. Thanks, I, I will email you. So yes. that I can ask you my question. Oh, here we go. And anybody else, please gather the other questions that may have been in the room that I didn't get to. Um, I will answer all of them. But your work is wonderful. I've always loved it. And it's 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 powerful. So thank all you. All right. For thanks. With us. Yeah. Thank you. And Teresa, thank may you. let me know. Yo, hey, maybe I'll see you out in, in San Diego. <laughs> all right. Peace, y'all. Thank you. Okay, we'll break now and um, be back here at 1.30.